Recognize Umbral Walker D01. Recognize Aqualad B02. Hi everyone, welcome to the cave, and welcome also to our second installment of Secret Origins. In this series, we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, from the heroes to supporting cast characters and even villains. Thanks to the input of over 70 of our listeners who follow us on Twitter at the YJ Files, our second episode features Aqualad, one of our favorites. Note that in Secret Origins, we will be attempting to avoid the larger spoilers, but scenes and story arcs from both seasons of Young Justice may come up as we're discussing their connection to the comics, so please keep that in mind. With that, let's dive in. Enough! Captain Marvel has been captured, and we must act as a team to save him. <laughs> Under your leadership? I don't think so. This is not up for debate. You all chose me to lead. When the mission is over, if you wish to select a new leader, I will happily step down. But until that time, I am in command here. So there are three characters, technically, that have carried the name Aqualad. We'll talk about all three of them, although the second two are somewhat the same character. We'll get that in a minute. The first appearance of Aqualad is the Garth Aqualad, was in Venture, Adventure Comics number 269 in February of 1960. He was created by Rob Bernstein and the Eisner Comics Hall of Fame Ramona Fraden. The first appearance of the Calderon that we're familiar with in Young Justice is actually Young Justice, Independence Day, and we'll get into that as well. Created, uh, obviously, by Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti and the brilliant character designer Phil Barassa. The first appearance of the third-ish version of Aqualad is Jackson Hyde. He appeared in DC Comics' Brightest Day number 4 in July of 2010. He was adapted for the comics by Jeff Johns and Ivan Rice based on what they were seeing Greg Weissman, Brandon Vietti, and Phil Barassa develop for the Young Justice television series. So we can't talk about Aqualad without talking about Garth. Those of you who have seen the TV series know Garth from the Downtime episode, where it's discussed how this splitting of characters happened why we have the Calderon Aqualad as opposed to the Garth Aqualad. So let's chat about Garth a bit. So the original Aqualad was the son of King Thar and Queen Bera of a country called Shayeris, which was the capital of a series of colonies in a location called the Hidden Valley. Uh, radicals deposed and killed King Thar and banished the pregnant Queen Bera to Poseidonus, which was the, which is the capital city of Atlantis. Their son, Garth, was born with purple eyes, and like in some of Aquaman's origins with his blonde hair, Aqualad, the soon-to-be Aqualad, was exiled to die due to their superstitions. He survived, obviously, and befriended Aquaman during one of the king's periods of exile, which happened a lot in the comics, returning story arc theme, and Garth became his ally, friend, and somewhat ward. So the first appearance of what would become the Teen Titans was in 1964, Brave and the Bold number 54. That team was Robin, the Garth Aqualad, and Kid Flash, who bound together to stop the menace of none other than Mr. Twister, who we saw in Episode 3 of Young Justice. So later, those three sidekicks joined forces with Speedy, who's Green Arrow's sidekick, and Wonder Girl, the Donna Troy Wonder Girl, not the Wonder Girl you see in Season 2 of Young Justice. Uh, they band together in order to free their mentors in the Justice League from being mind-controlled. Uh, they decide to become a real team called the Teen Titans. Garth appeared numerous times in the Superman-Aquaman Adventure Hour in the late 60s and early 70s, and the little-known Aquaman spin-off cartoon, that happened also at the, around that same time, the late 60s and early 70s. I remember sitting in my living room <laughs> watching that Aquaman spinoff series with awe and fascination. So like Aquaman, Garth had the ability to speak with and control marine creatures, and he also had enhanced strength and speed beyond that of other Atlanteans. Why that was the case when he seemed to be just like another Atlantean 
subject uh, comes up a little bit later. Far later in his career, he discovered that the marking of his purple eyes and theoretically this enhanced strength and speed and ability to speak with other marine animals meant that he had access to powerful magical abilities. He was taken into a pocket dimension by a character called Atlan, who is a powerful Atlantean sorcerer and is also the father of King Orin, aka Aquaman. And he was trained to manifest his mystic destiny, becoming the character called Tempest. Now you'll note that in the downtime episode, at one point toward the end of the fight with Black Manta, Garth says, I summon the power of the Tempest. That's clearly a nod to who he will become. The character of Garth's first love was Tula, to Young Justice fans, no one's surprise, aka Aqua Girl, who died during Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was a massive crossover event in the 80s that took the infinite variations of Earth in the DC Universe and melded them into one planet. We had several characters who died, got mishmashed, changed, retconned origins, all kinds of things in Infinite Earths. It was quite the event back in the day. Aqua Girl died at the hands of a villain named Chemo, who had poisoned the water that she was in uh, with, I don't even know what at the time, a, a chemical mixture of some sort. Uh, and her death nearly broke Garth. On a personal note, as much as I love Aqualad and, in Young Justice, and as much as I love Aquaman as a character, the Garth Aqualad was sad. He was already had inferiority issues and a lot of things that made him a hard character to get behind. With the death of Tula in the comics, all of that got turned to 11. He eventually recovered through some pretty harsh means of basically reprogramming his mind. Uh, that reprogramming made him lose his ability to speak with and command marine animals, but it helped him to deal with this crushing depression and loss over Tula. And he eventually, down the line, found a new partner and a wife and a father to his children. But the loss of Tula really heavily informed much of his character for years. We have a few um, great sources. There's not a lot, actually, you can find out there on Aqualad, the original Garth Aqualad, which is a little bit sad. Uh, there is the web.archive.org has an archived uh, website called www.titanstower.com, and that has uh, some fantastic information. And then also, of course, the uh, wiki, Wikipedia article on Aqualad. With all that in mind, and reflecting on how that affects the storylines that you see in Young Justice, let's dive into Calder. So Calderam in Young Justice also hails from the city of Shearis. He's the adopted son of Shalanya, Shalanya, Shalana. There's a lot of apostrophes in that name. Who is a native of Shearis, and the adopted son of Calvin Durham, who is a henchman of Black Manta, who is genetically altered to infiltrate Atlantis and be a spy against Aquaman. Calvin Durham actually is an old school character from the comics, and it never occurred to me that Calderam was a version of Calvin Durham. I don't know why it never occurred to me. The first appearance of Calvin Durham was in the Aquaman comics in 1977, and then he became a somewhat regular, joining forces with Aquaman on occasion to thwart Black Manta. Every time I think I know every possible Easter egg or DC Comics tie-in, I find something else. And the Calvin Durham thing blew me away when I was researching this for you guys. The young Justice is just the gift that keeps on giving. So back to Calder. At the age of 12, Calder enters a mandatory two years of military service, and then at the age of 14, enters the Conservatory of Sorcery. Shortly after joining the conservatory, Aquaman in the Young Justice Continuum nearly dies facing Ocean Master, when both Calder and Garth attack Ocean Master, giving their king time to recover and end the fight. Aquaman offers an apprenticeship to one of the two. Garth turns down the opportunity and goes back to the conservatory for his studies, but Calder accepted and began splitting his time between his sorcerer studies at the conservatory and adventuring with his king. So that brings us to where he starts in Young Justice. At the age of 16, he's been doing this for two years. 
And then he, even though he's been parallel studying at the conservatory and with Aquaman, his studies fall behind when he goes to the surface to join the team. At the time of downtime, he's been on the surface for a couple of months. And we do see him in season two becoming a much more, even more impressive fighter than he already is. We'll get into that a little bit later. But he doesn't seem to have many more sorcerous powers. They all seem to echo his original powers. So we see that he doesn't really continue his sorcerer studies beyond what he already has. Now, I mentioned a third character that held the name Aqualad, and this is a bit of a hazy area. The character's name is Jackson Hyde. He's the newest Aqualad in the DC Comics series. He was actually introduced in the comics five months before the premiere of Young Justice, but his creation was heavily influenced by the creation of Calder. The current status of Jackson Hyde and DC's Rebirth, which is their current revamping, is a little bit vague, um, and I haven't been able to find that much about it. I'm not currently reading the Rebirth comics due to time, unfortunately. But if anyone has more information as the series continues, please let us know, and we will make some comments and updates uh, on at the YJ Files on Twitter and on our Facebook page as well. So as I mentioned before, Jackson, the character creation of Jackson was inspired by Jeff Johns, who some of you may know is now the series runner, basically, for the DC live-action movies. Watching Greg Weissman, Brandon Vietti, and Phil Barassa develop Calder for the Young Justice TV series. So there are some parallels, but not the same. This Jackson Hyde was raised on the surface. He had been kidnapped by Queen Mera's people and experimented on. He is the son of Black Manta in that series, but it's very, it, it's a little bit different. We'll see how that pans out or if he comes back in rebirth at all. I would like to see Jackson return or some version of him that's reflective of Calder. He's just a much more intriguing and deep character than Garth ever was. Sorry, Garth. So let's talk about power sets. And we're going to focus mostly on Calder here because really Garth's power sets were pretty basic. So Calder. Calder has two mystic eel tattoos that you see throughout the series. They're permanent and they're always visible. They give him hydrokinesis or his control, sorcerer's control of them, allows him to control water and harden water, which is a power in the DC comics that has pretty much been limited to Queen Mera. So it's nice to see that expanding out into some other heroes. The two lightsaber hilt-like weapons that he has are called water bearers. They connect to his backpack that is, always has a volume of water in it that he can manipulate even when he's not near or in water. But he's not limited to their use with just that water. As we see in a number of a number of episodes, he can use, even the very first episode, he can use water that's available to him, whether it's salt or fresh. He uses firemen's, uh, excuse me, the firefighters' hoses in Independence Day to help put out the fire and rescue individuals. He's used them as shields, force walls, n creating giant manifestations of creatures. It's pretty, pretty impressive. In addition to that, those mystic eels allow him to generate bioelectric charges. There's no range to these charges. They're all melee related. Fortunately, though, he happens to have this control of water. So uh, assuming that the water bearers water in his backpack are salt water, which I assume it's going to conduct electricity excellently. And it's used in their combat choreography quite well to a great effect. And I'm really excited to see that combo of powers. According to Greg Weissman, the reason why Calder's tattoos are visible at all times, why I mentioned that earlier, as opposed to those you see on Tula or Garth or Queen Mera in the downtime episode when they're using their sorcerer's powers, is because of the fact that he left his studies so early. So in the time that he's been gone, Tula and Garth have mastered the ability to like subsume or absorb those tattoos, becoming more one with the power of those tattoos where Calder still has them on the surface because he hasn't quite mastered the depth or breadth of power. I'd like to hear more about that, especially if we get a season three or we get some more comics to talk about Tula and, and how she died and what happened with that in between seasons. He also, in addition to those powers, he has resistance to extreme cold and pressure, obviously. Um, he's able to dive to extreme depths and he would need that. 
He is, however, vulnerable to heat and dry conditions. We see that also reflected in Miss Martian, which makes for a couple of interesting scenes where they are both suffering from the same weakness, but from different directions. He has super strength and speed. We see that in the first episode where he's going toe-to-toe with Superboy. He does eventually get beaten by Superboy, but I love the fact that they are showing the strength, the speed, the enhanced durability of Atlanteans, and we're getting a a sight of Aquaman-like powers that aren't just swims fast, talks to fish. And I'm quoting a friend of mine on that one. He is a highly skilled hand-to-hand and melee combatant, even more so than you see, for example, Garth and Tula. And I think some of that comes from his military background, the fact that he did have two years of military training, though it, it was mandatory, so I'm assuming Tula and Garth had to go through it as well. In this case, though, he's getting more practical field experience than Garth or Tula ever did because he's not only out in the field with Aquaman, but we see in downtime where he disappears, pulls a robin, basically, and ninjas out of there. Garth doesn't know what happens, and then suddenly Aqualad's taking down some bad guys that Garth didn't know was there. So his practical fighting skills have been honed in the field. In addition to that, he's multilingual, obviously English and Atlantean, But according to Greg Weissman, he is also passable in modern and ancient Greek, which, according to Greg Weissman in the Young Justice universe, is a precursor to Atlantean. All right, let's talk a little bit about this Aqualad character from the DC Comics reflected in Young Justice. At the time Young Justice aired, the Garth Aqualad had died, and the comics continued. This allowed the creative team who was working on Young Justice to create a new and, frankly, far more interesting Aqualad. This also helped to expand the core team's diversity, which was pretty sorely lacking. Garth was never the most intriguing character at the best of times, as much as I wanted to love him. And it, that comment's coming from someone who spent his life defending his love for Aquaman and Robin. Two of, two of the 70s and 80s not most popular characters. Along with his obvious like superpowers that I just listed, the writers did a great job of playing off the fact that Aqualad is the apprentice to the king of one of the largest countries on the planet. Calder's calm, he's charismatic, he's commanding. He starts off with many of those characteristics, but we also get to see him later on in episodes like like Alpha Male, where he has to be reminded, in this case by Captain Marvel, that he gets to command. That's what he gets to do because they voted him the leader of the group, and for an appropriate reason. Great episode. He has a presence and a strength of personality that makes him someone to be respected and admired. In our last Secret Origins episode, I talked about the difference between Batman and Nightwing's leadership style, where Batman demands that orders be followed, and he does through strength of presence. He also does it because people know that he's probably right, and so not following him is dumb. Captain Marvel makes a comment about that in that Alpha Male's episode where he says he didn't like the way Batman did his business, but Captain Marvel never, never disobeyed an order and says that's probably why I'm still alive. Nightwing is a different kind of character. He inspires loyalty in his friends and his teammates, and it's one of the things that I absolutely love about the character. This Calder has that same quality. And it's an opposite quality of the Garth Aqualad from the comics, who is often the least present, the least interesting, the least heroic in some ways, I hate to say, of the Titans from back in the day. Where Dick Grayson's leadership style comes as a counterpoint to his mentor's leadership style, almost like a rebellion, Calder's comes as a reflection of his mentor. I can't help but think that the Earth-16 Young Justice Robin, Dick Grayson Robin, adopted some of his leadership style that he incorporated later as he grew up from seeing Calder being the impressive leader that he was in season one. I just can't help but think that Dick Grayson 
became the character that I always wanted him to be on a TV series, the character that I saw in the comics because of Calder's influence on him. And there's something about that that makes me really, really happy. So that's our Secret Origins episode on Calder. If you have other questions, please let us know. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Secret Origins. Coming up next on Secret Origins, the storied and deeply buried history of Artemis. You can get a hold of us with any questions, updates on Jackson Hyde, please, or any other questions having to do with Calder, Aqualad, the team, villains, anyone else you want to see in a Secret Origin episode, at the YJ Files on Twitter, at www.facebook.com crashing the mode on Facebook by emailing us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com or at our website crashingthemode.com www.crashingthemode.com I encourage you to link over to the website to check out links to some fantastic Calderon fan art including an Aqualad Aquaman mashup image by an artist named Tox S. We'll have a link to that in the show notes in addition to an image and link on the website. Whoever Toxess is, imagine what would happen in 15, 20 years when Aquaman stands down and Aqualad inherits the Trident, and it's awesome. As always, please remember to hashtag Keep Binging YJ on Netflix and join us for our next regular episode of The Young Justice Files. Stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.